Good evening. My name is Paul Holden Graeber, and I'm the director of public programs at the New York Public Library, known as Live from the New York Public Library. As most of you, I think, by now know, my goal here at the library, apart from pro providing you with cognitive theater, is simply to make the lions roar, to make this great institution levitate. To help us achieve this goal, we have tonight Christopher Hitchens. Hitch. I should have paused there. Hitch, as you will discover, he's a Times called, asked me to be brief. Not my forte. You know, the famous line of Pascal, if I had had more time, I would have made it shorter. I will, though, do my best. No bio here, as we are here to speak precisely about the man himself, his memoir, Hitch 22. But I have to tell you what is coming up briefly. On Monday, our very first evening in Bryant Park, pray that it does not rain, I will speak with John Waters, he loves no one more, you will discover if you come, than Johnny Mattis. On Tuesday, the photographer Lena Herzog will be here to discuss Lost Souls, her haunting photographs. I encourage you all to see her exhibition of Lost Souls on view now at the International Center for Photography, Our Neighbors in Mid-Manhattan. We will end the season with an evening on soccer. Stay tuned for that one, as well as news about our upcoming season, fall season, which will include conversations with Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, Edwidge Danticat, Antonio Frazier, Derek Walcott, Nicole Krauss with David Grossman, Zadie Smith, Angela Davis with Tony Morrison, and many others. Libraries, as Christopher Hitchens knows very well, matter greatly to our democracy. Did you know that Keith Richards, one of the founding members of the Rolling Stones, is writing his memoir due out in October? In it, he confesses, I wonder what Hitch will think about this, in it he confesses his secret longing to be a librarian. When I'm not... I'm not wondering what Hitch thinks about that. I think that he would think that that is a very good thing and noble thing to be, but he says this. When you were growing up, Keith Richards writes, there are two institutional places that affect you most powerfully. The church, which belongs to God, and the public library that belongs to you. The public library, he says, is a great equalizer. I plan to invite Keith Richards to be on stage, indeed I have already invited him, to come to discuss, among other things, the role of libraries. I think we have other things to discuss with Keith Richards. But I will also talk to him about the role of libraries in our democracy. I urge you to become a supporter of the New York Public Library. Here is my plea. Be it a young lion, if you are young enough or feel young enough, or a conservator, or consider becoming part of the President's Council. The New York Public Library is in the middle of a campaign. Don't close the books on libraries. The New York Public Library is facing, if you didn't know it, the harshest cut in its history. A proposed city budget right now, a reduction of $37 million that could shut down 10 branches as of July and slash service to just four days a week. You can immediately support the library. By immediately, I mean now. I'm going to show you how. You can immediately support the library and its mission with a simple text message. So, take out your phones now. I'll ask you to shut them later. And text NYPL to the number 27722 to give $10 from your mobile phone. You, when Prompted reply yes to complete this one-time gift. Again, that is NYPL 27722. Don't see many people with phones out. <laughs> a one-time $10 donation will appear on your next mobile bill as a separate line item and is recognized as a tax-deductible donation. Thank you for your support. Flyers should indeed be on your chairs if you wish to take care of this later or, as probably most of you will do, donate several times. 
Our wonderful independent bookseller will have Hitch 22 available for purchase. Christopher Hitchens has graciously agreed to sign his memoir after our conversation. Our wonderful bookseller is 192 Books. It is now finally, and this was not all too brief, I know, Christopher, I'm sorry, a pleasure to welcome Christopher Hitchens back to the stage. Last time he debated his last book, God is Not Great, with Reverend Al Sharpton. They entered the room to Gregorian chant, I don't know if you remember that, and took to the stage with James Brown. You entered tonight uh, to the music mostly of Bob Dylan, which Hitchens loves. Tonight, Please warmly welcome Hitch to the stage, to the music of Fats Waller, Your Feet's Too Big. We will explain why. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Hitchens and Fats Waller. Who can walk around here? Like baby paddle, baby elephant paddle, that's what I call it. Say, up in Harlem, at a table for two, there were four of us, me, your big feet, and you. From your ankle up, I'll say you show sure are sweet. From that down, there's just too much feet. Yes, your feet's too big. Don't want you cause your feet's too big. Can't use you cause your feet's too big. I really hate you cause your feet's too big. Yeah. I know, it's, 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 it's a shame to talk after that, but here we are to do that. And um, your feet's too big. I didn't mean that about you, but you write about your father, the commander. He disliked coming to London on principle as at, and had enraged me when I was younger by refusing to take a job as a secretary of Brooks Club. I would have been living in London in Mayfair for heaven's sake and when I was a teenager, exclamation point. Mm. But I did once lure, lure him to the detested city to see a musical about Fats Waller, an uncharacteristic favorite of his, your feet's too big. And he once astonished me by asking in the late 1970s if I'd care to come with him to the reunion of old shipmates, and on and on and on. Tell us something about your father and maybe what you remember about that musical when you went with your father. Give us a portrait of him, if you would. Well, the old man who we used to call the commander affectionately because it was the highest rank uh, to which he attained in the Royal Navy, in which he'd served all his life, um, was a rather inward, uh, slightly morose man who had the virtues of thrift and um, honesty and uh, also courage. Um, during the course of the Second World War, he, in which he told me one of his very few confiding remarks he said that when he was fighting the Nazis, it was the only time in his entire life he felt he knew what he was doing. <laughs> it didn't occur to me until later that didn't, it meant he didn't know what he was doing when, say, he had a son in 1949 or uh, things like that. But I, I would have, that would have been, a, to me, a trivial remark because I was brought up entirely on the history of British wartime valor. And we used to have a toast every Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, because on that day in 1943, his ship, HMS Jamaica, had sent... Uh, a big Nazi convoy raiding pocket battleship called the Scharnhorst to the bottom of the sea, um, which is a better day's work, as I say in the book, than any I've ever done myself. And I still have a toast every Boxing Day for that reason. But in fact, in a funny way, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, it wasn't under his control to know that because he certainly had not joined His Majesty's Royal Navy 